Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming on this last day. Uh, last day before the holidays. Um, so this is about, um, about getting res res results into practice. Um, until March the 10th, 2010, I didn't know anything about how to get research into practice because I, I didn't have anything useful to say. You know, I didn't need to know how to disseminate research results because I had nothing to disseminate. Oh. oh. So, um, but on, March, on the 10th of March, 2010, all of that changed. And so, I suddenly found myself in a position of having something useful to say and not knowing how to say it. So we'd been working on, uh, uh, as I've told, told you many times, we'd, 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 we were very interested in this treatment, tranexamic acid. And um, it's a treatment that's sold in, you know, for heavy menstrual bleeding and uh, the bleeding that you get after tooth extraction and it works by stopping blood clots breaking down. So this is, this is blood, this yellow stuff is fibrin, um, and when, you, when you're bleeding, this net of fibrin develops to stop, to stop the bleeding, but there's this enzyme in the blood called plasmin that chops this net up into little pieces, and so you bleed more quickly. And some very clever Japanese researchers in the 1950s identified a drug called tranexamic acid that stops that enzyme. It inhibits that enzyme. And we'd seen that it reduces death and bleeding in surgery. And we thought, well, you know, the sort of bleeding that you get in surgery is very similar to the sort of bleeding that you get in car crashes and violence. This woman's been stabbed in the stomach. I mean, being stabbed in the stomach's not that different from being opened up by a surgeon. So we thought it should have the same effect. And we did this big trial called CRASH-2. And, um, and we found it was effective. So we got this really good treatment benefit, a reduction in mortality with tranexamic acid, and it was even better if you give the treatment really early. So if you give this drug really early, it's really life-saving. So, and this is, you know, death. So a 30% reduction in death is, is quite, it's quite good, you know, and, and it's, it, it's, it's not a play, the play of chance. If you give it a little bit later, it gets a little bit less effective, but still quite effective. And if you give it late, it doesn't seem to work at all and might increase the risk. So, and it works everywhere. So it works, um, it doesn't seem to vary. You know, it, it, it's equally effective wherever you use it. So because it was a big trial, we had 20,000 patients. We had hospitals in Asia. Latin America, Africa, Europe and Australia and, and uh, Canada. And the treatment effect was the same. Um, this, when you look at these sorts of graphs, the, the critical thing is, is there any heterogeneity? So you're not looking if these are all st you know, s statistically significant compared to this. We're actually looking if this, this, this and this vary from that and they don't. So, after doing research for about 20 years and never finding anything that works, suddenly we found something that works. And, um, you know, and then we worked out how many lives could you save with this treatment if it was used around the world. And we worked out that it was about 130,000 lives a year. So, wow, that's not bad. You know, most of the lives would be saved in countries like China and India, which have big populations and lots of trauma. 
but also countries like Brazil and the United States, where they like to shoot each other. Um, they think it's a constitutional right to do that. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's an important, we had an important message to disseminate and, you know, who's going to do it? Highly cost effective, you know, it's really cheap. So, you know, if you had, I've, I've, to, I've talked about this earlier in the week, this is cost per life year gained. So if you had a million pounds and you wanted to, to save lives with it, you'd first use it on insecticide treated bed nets because that's the best way to save a life. That's the most cost effective treatment. So if, you, if you've got a million dollars, um, you could save 20,000 lives with that million dollars by using it on, on insecticide treated bed nets. You could save 17,000 lives if you use tranexamic acid in trauma and you could spare, save 800 lives if you, if you used it in, as antiretroviral anti therapy. So this is, I mean, this com refers back to some of the things I've been talking about in the week about, you know, the relative cost effectiveness as being the way we should determine uh, our health priorities. And, I mean, actually, the reverse happens. Because the, the HIV lobby is very strong, because people, you know, say, right, we must have antiretroviral treatment for the world. Like the woman in the, in the, in the, in the hospital that was closed, you know, she was getting antiretroviral treatment. She wasn't getting anything, they weren't giving anything else in that hospital, but you could get antiretroviral treatment. So if we, if we argue just for our problem, you know, actually, we can do a lot of harm, or we can not do a lot of good. So, but, so I think, you know, tranexamic acid for trauma, it's highly cost effective. And once you've done insecticide treated bed nets, it's, an, it's a really good spend. So I thought, well, wow, my goodness, here I, here I am. I've been doing research for 20 years. I've never shown anything to be effective until now. This is good, you know. I'm lucky because, you know, a lot of people might go through their whole lives without showing anything to be effective. Um, so very lucky, but I thought, well, you know, it's, this is a lot of lives. It's a cheap generic drug. The pharmaceutical company isn't going to make sure that people get it. The pharmaceutical company isn't going to advertise this result to the world. So I'll try and do it. So I went to the funder, the British government funder, the National Institute of Health Research, and I said, look, we've got a great result. You funded this trial. You gave us two million pounds to do this trial. And we've got this fantastic result that can save 130,000 lives a year. I want I want you to give me half a million pounds to disseminate this result, right? So the trial cost two million pounds and we wanted half a million pounds for dissemination. And I wrote a long, you know, I wrote proper argument why it's important to do this and what we're going to spend the money on. And so I asked them for half a million pounds. And they gave us 10,000. <laughs> right? They gave us 10,000. I mean, I don't know if that's good news or bad news. It could have been worse. It could have been worse, but it wasn't much better than worst. <laughs> you know, um, we, we thought, oh, we can do a, we, we've really got an important message to, to, to send to the world. Now, if you can invest two million pounds in generating this knowledge, Surely you can invest half a million in disseminating this knowledge. But they said, no, it's not our job. And I thought, hmm, OK, well, ten, well, OK, so we take 10,000 pounds. And then it's, well, that's a bit of a problem now, you know. Um, well, first of all, who, who believes it's my problem? I mean, to what extent do you believe that the researcher has got an obligation to disseminate results if they're important? 
Is it the researcher's job or somebody else's job? What, what do you think? You think it's, do you think it's your responsibility to spread the news or do you just publish the results in a journal and that stops there? I think the researcher should push. The researcher should push. I find some people feel the researcher should push and other people think the researcher, the researcher sh it's not the right, it's not the researcher's responsibility. Maybe we can have a show of hands. Who think it's the researcher's responsibility? Okay, so quite, quite a few people think it's... And who, who thinks it's not their responsibility? Epidemiologist. Yeah, the responsibility of the statistician or the epidemiologist. Not the researcher. Epidemiologist is a public health practitioner. Pro public health practitioner, not the researcher. No. Okay. I mean, this is what I find. It's about it's close to a 50-50 split. Some people think it's the obligation of the researcher and some people think it's not the obligation of the researcher because, well, for a start, the researcher might not be any good at doing that, yeah? Because researchers are, are quite, I mean, we have a certain sort of, I don't know if this is true, maybe, I'll say it anyway, we have a certain kind of personality which tends to be more introverted and, you know, <laughs> focused. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So in my university, you have professors just wandering around the corridors and, and, you, and you say good morning to them and they go, oh! <laughs> you know? they, because they're just lost in their thoughts. Yeah? <laughs> oh, hi, oh, oh. <laughs> they, 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 you frighten them. You know? and, and they're not the best people necessarily for you know, disseminating the research. But... Um, but I, I, of the 50-50 split, I felt that the researchers have a responsibility. In fact, I feel that I, I, I trained as a doctor and then I moved into epidemiology because I felt that that's a more effective way of being a doctor. Yeah? That actually doctoring, you know, you're doing stuff every day and you don't know if it's good or if it's bad. And so finding out if something's good or bad is a better way of being a doctor, I, I, or I felt. So, you know, and, and, and sometimes I think we, people ask me, are you clinical or non-clinical? I say, well, I, you know, I, I'm clinical. You know, in my mind, I'm clinical um, because I'm trying to find what's the right thing to do clinically. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, Dr. Furukawa, do you consider yourself a practicing psychiatrist? You might be as well. Well, in my mind, I'm still a clinician. That's it. I, I feel exactly the same as you. Although I don't see patients, I, you know, we consider ourselves clinicians because actually finding out the right thing to do seems to be the, you know, a, a more effective way of, of doing medicine. Um, so, £10,000. What could we do with £10,000? So the first, thing we the first thing we decided to invest it in is trying to get this treatment on the WHO list of essential medicines. And there's lots of bureaucracy to do that. And that took about three months. Three to six months, and that used up all the £10,000. Um, so... But we got, we got the treatment on the WHO list of essential medicines. But the WHO doesn't do anything with that list. It just, it, you just put the name on the list and then countries may or may not buy that treatment. But, you know, it, it doesn't disseminate anything. It, it doesn't spread the word or anything like that. So I, we got it on the list of essential medicines and then it was the summer holidays, and I went, I went, I was born in Wales, and I go back to Wales, and I was talking to my brother's son, my nephew, and he's, um, he's an, he, he was a student, uh, he, at, this, at the time, he was a student of animation, he likes making cartoons, so he was an, a student animator at Bristol University, and I said to him, look, you know, 
oh, you know, he was, he was saying, you know, Uncle Ian, what's happening? And I said, well, you know, I've got this great result and I only got 10,000 pounds and now I've spent it all. And, and uh, he said, well, look, I'm, I'll make you a cartoon, right? So he goes up to his bedroom and then he comes down three months later and he's made this cartoon. So I'll show you the cartoon. So he, he made that and we thought, all right, let, so we posted it on, on YouTube and um, it was very popular. People s sent it to other people and it, it got very popular and, and it actually got picked up by the New York Times. Uh, so the New York Times wrote an article about it and that made people, lots of people look at it. And then... Um, and then I thought, this is great. You know, we've got this viral video going about tranexamic acid and it's really cheap. So uh, it was a very cheap way of disseminating res research results. Um, until somebody rang me up from, from Google and they said, I'm terribly sorry, we have to take your video down. And I said, why? It's going so well, you know. <laughs> why do you have to take it down? And they said, well, you're advertising a drug to the public and it, you know, you can't do that. So, you know, you're a, you know, YouTube is open to everybody and um, there isn't, tranexamic acid is not licensed for use in trauma. It's licensed for use in heavy menstrual periods. You know, I could have made a video about heavy menstrual periods but you can't make a video about trauma because it's not licensed for that use. Ah, <sighs> disappointed that I had to take it down. And so it's not licensed for use in trauma. So I thought, well, let's get, let's get them to license it, you know? So this is the um, chief executive of Pfizer. Pfizer make tranexamic acid. So I, I, I wrote to Pfizer and I said, um, well, when I say I wrote to Pfizer, that's that's an understatement. I, I interacted with Pfizer over a period of two years to try and get them to license tranexamic acid. And the way it works with drug licensing is, is this. So Pfizer, were, F Pfizer didn't invent the drug. It was invented by Japanese researchers in the 60s. But they gave the, they gave the, the rights to it to a company called Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Mitsubishi gave it to, Mitsubishi was taken over by Pharmacia and Upjohn, and, or Upjohn, Upjohn was taken over by Pharmacia. Pharmacia and Upjohn was taken over by um, Pfizer. So Pfizer now are the license holder, but by this time it's a generic drug, so anybody can make it, right? So anybody can make this drug. Um, now Pfizer, to get a license for its use in trauma, has to make an application to the FDA and it has to make an application fee and the application fee is about a million dollars yeah and so so it has to invest a million dollars and it has to invest some money to get the staff to put all of the data together and it decided that the return on the investment was too low and it wasn't going to do it you know, it's, it's like, well, I've, we've got to invest maybe, you know, a million dollars to do this. And it's a generic drug and it's not worth, it's not worth the money to do this. So, so then I thought, oh, damn, Pfizer won't do it. I tried to do all sorts of things. I tried to shame them into doing it because at the time, patient, peop, American soldiers were dying in the, in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so I said, look, you know, it's like, I wrote, to, I wrote to President Obama and everybody, I said, you know, it's, it, it's I, I, write to President Obama, copy to this man, and, 
you know, saying it's disappointing that Pfizer's not going to do, 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 you know. And um, this guy was cleverer than me. He was really clever because what he did, he put somebody, he, he, he allocated somebody to take care of me. And he allocated this very nice man that I had monthly teleconferences with for two years who said, yes, you know, we're very interested in your treatment and we're going to apply for a license. And we've just got to do various different steps. So, you know, and I, he, he asked for this information this month and this information next month and this information the next month after. And he went on and on and on and on. And for two years, and I said, come on, what's going to happen? Surely we're going to make the application now. He said, I'm terribly sorry, got bad news. At the end of this two-year process, he knew from the start, I'm sure of it. <laughs> he knew. They were so clever. They just managed me. They didn't want me writing to President Obama, copying it to the chief executive of Pfizer. So they managed me really well. I'm very impressed by this man. Don't like him. <laughs> Don't like him, but I'm impressed by him. So they're very clever um, in ways that academics are not. Um, so um, I wanted NICE to uh, put it in NICE guidelines. And NICE couldn't put it in NICE guidelines because you can't, by law, you can't put anything in NICE. I should say what NICE is. It's the British government sort of um, uh, treatment you know, th things that guidance about how you should use a treatment. And so it's very influential because lots of other countries around the world look to NICE guidelines to, to, to be influential, uh, to decide what should be in their guidance. Um, but NICE couldn't license, couldn't put it in guidance because it was not licensed for that thing. So the, the Pfizer problem was getting in the way again. Uh, and I couldn't solve the Pfizer problem. So I started doing the same thing in the UK. I started writing to the Prime Minister, copying to NICE. And eventually something did happen. They made a way where NICE could make a recommendation of something, even though it wasn't licensed. And, and tranexamic acid was the first, first off-label evidence. Uh, so that was good. That was a small, a, a, a small advantage. And then we had another good thing going. We had, um, we worked with victims' organizations. So in the UK, we're, now we're very much encouraged when we do research to work with the people who suffer from, the, from that problem. Yeah? And sometimes, now you can't get research money from the British government unless you're working with patient groups who suffer that, for that problem. So if you wanted to do work on depression, you'd have to work with you know, groups of people who represent depressed people or um, depressed people themselves. So we worked with Road Peace and it worked very well because Road Peace, it's an organization of um, family members of people who have been killed on the roads. And so they're very, very motivated so that no one else dies on the roads. And so they wrote to all of the hospitals in the country with freedom of information requests saying, can you tell me how many of your patients were treated with tranexamic acid in the last year? And of course, that's very powerful because you get a freedom of information request written to the chief executive. And the chief executive thinks, well, what's, what's, what's this? You know? What is this drug, tranexamic acid? I've never heard of it. And it. So they talk to the emergency department. How many patients are using tranexamic acid? Well, we don't know. Well, find out. <laughs> you know? So it, it, it's a, it was very useful. And they started doing this every year to all of the hospitals in the country. Every year, freedom of information request. And slowly, slowly, the numbers of, of patients that were treated went up and up. Um, but another good thing happened. And... and, and it was this. Well, it's a bad thing, but it's a good thing. Uh, it's the first of all, many injuries suffered on the battlefield result in severe bleeding. Something like... Oh, sorry, I tried to raise the, the, the uh, volume there. It's key to saving lives. So the discovery that an old drug can perform new tricks is great news for military personnel. There was a recent trial carried out by the hospital hydro 
of Dr. Benson, um, which was sponsored by NIHR called CASH 2 trial. And it looked at the reduction of something called tannin-dunk acids, which stops clots breaking down. Within weeks of that trial delivering its results, we now use that as part of our treatment process. So that was very good, right? So there was a war in Afghanistan. The British army starts using tranexamic acid in Afghanistan. So that, that's very good propaganda because emergency physicians, at least in the UK, they look up to the army, right? So the, if the army doctors are using it, they think, oh, this is a really good thing. Uh, let, let, we should be using it too. So the army doctors started using it in Afghanistan and that strongly encouraged British doctors to see it as, you know, a good, uh, you know, sort of sexy drug. You know, the army's using it, let's, we should be using it too. So that helped a lot. The best army, no, it's not the best army. If you want an army to be using it though, you really want the US army to be using it because US U.S. Army influences all of U.S. healthcare, and U.S. healthcare influences a lot of the world. So I, I've been to when I was doing the trial, I, I, when we were doing the Crash Two trial. You know, we, we worked in Latin America and places, and all sorts of places, and you would get American doctors talking about, you know, giving lectures about how to manage things, and they would go like this. In Boston, we do this, right? And you don't need any more evidence than that, you know? If they do it in Boston, it must be a good thing, you know? So they don't, they weren't showing you randomized trials, <laughs> you know? I didn't see any randomized trials, uh, you know, and I'm sitting there at the front listening, Where, where's the randomized trials? And they just say, well, you know, they just say, this is what we do, right? This is what we do, and that's it. That's all you need to know, doctors in Colombia, is that we do this. And therefore, the implication is that you should do that too. So, I don't like that, but if you can get the US Army to, 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 to use something, then it sort of has a big effect around the world. So, we tried to get the US Army, um, so the British Army were using it, so we said the US Army, you know, why aren't you using this? It could reduce death in your soldiers. Um, and they, they had a meeting in Washington. So eventually they had a meeting in Washington. They invited me to this meeting, and I thought, and it was a, a meeting of military medical uh, people. And, you know, they had all of these uniforms on, and they have these things on their shoulder, you know, big things. And I thought, how do you, how do you convey a relative risk of 0.7 to a military medical, you know, a military medical doctor? Um, because they, they tend to be surgeons, and surgeons are less interested in epidemiology. Um, and, you know, it's kind of black and white. So I, I went to, this is Arlington Cemetery. Arlington Cemetery is the cemetery in Washington where they bury people who have been, bury soldiers. It's a soldier's graveyard in Washington. And I found this special plot of land where they bury soldiers who are killed in Afghanistan. So I, I took a picture of it, and it just happened there were a hundred graves on that, in that, in, you, there's a hundred graves visible there. And so I said, this is a relative risk of point, point 0.7, you know, that's a third reduction in deaths. And they liked that, right, so that they could get that. Um, they still were an easy audience. Um, I remember there was this one guy, he was this sort of chief, I don't know, he was quite a senior guy. and. Um, he was huge, and he was the most hairy man I've ever seen. He had, you know, he had his shirt and tie on like this, but there was this hair just flowing down here. It's like a waterfall of hair. And I just thought, my goodness, <laughs> this guy is such like, whoa, you know. And I thought, I, I, I tried not to be influenced by his manliness, you know. But at one, stage, at one stage, I stood up and said, he said something, this guy, this, um, this colonel said something. And I said, well that's, well, that's not true. And he just pointed at me, he said, Roberts, sit down. And I thought, wow. And I thought, 
what do I do? Do I sit down? <laughs> But I, I, I've never, you know, it, it's, it was kind of a different currency. In the university, we don't really do that. We don't use our manliness or our womanliness on our colleagues like that. But this is obviously what they do in, in the American army. Robert, sit down. So, um, it turned out that I couldn't persuade them with a the randomized evidence. Um, and... Uh, so they decided to do a study of their own, right? And what they did is that at that time in the war in Afghanistan, in this camp, Camp Bastion, uh, if you were, Camp Bastion is like, there was this big hospital in the, de in the desert in Afghanistan. And if everybody, all of the soldiers and the civilians who were injured in the war came to that hospital. Now, if you were, if you came to that hospital, you were either seen by British medical doctors or British doctors or American doctors. If you were seen by British doctors, you got tranexamic acid. If you were seen by American doctors, you didn't, right? Because they didn't agree, right? British doctors were doing it. They were, they were, very, um, they were very at war about this treatment, right? So the Br American doctors didn't like it, the British doctors did. So if you were seen by a British doctor, you got it. So they decided to do a cohort study, right? Comparing those who got tranexamic acid with those who didn't got tranexamic acid after controlling for severity. Now this is completely not the right way to evaluate treatments. It's, it, you know, risk adjusted cohort studies are not the way to see if treatments work. But luckily, they got the right answer. They got the right answer because we know what the right answer is because we did a big trial. So they, they did a cohort study and they found out that some, actually the patients who were seen by the British doctors were sicker than the patients who were seen by the American doctors, but still they were less likely to die. So uh, if you got TXA, you're less likely to, much less likely to die than if you didn't get TXA. And so they believed this because this was their own data. Now that's a very strange thing, you know, it, it, it's, it shows you how strange, how strange we all are that, you know, if you get a randomized trial with 20,000 patients and a, and a very clear reduction in mortality, and it doesn't vary by location, people don't believe it, but they will believe their own data that's much, much inferior. You know, that, that's just the way it goes. So they started believing this. And we were also doing other propaganda things. So, for example, I wrote to, uh, on the anniversary of President Kennedy, Kennedy's death, right? So K President Kennedy was a pro uh, you know, president of the United States who was shot. And I wrote to all the presidents in the world, because it's very easy to do. You, know, you write to all of the presidents in the world and you say, look, being a president is a dangerous job. You know? And so you might like to make sure your personal physician knows about tranexamic acid. In the US, it's a really dangerous job being a president. Of the 44 presidents, I mean, I'm, I think there might have been 46 by now, but you know, out of 44 presidents, when I last counted, 11 of them had been shot, you know? So that's one in four of presidents get shot. It's a very dangerous job. <laughs> so I wrote to him and I said, look, you know, you should, you should be using tranexamic acid. I thought, I'll never get a reply. <laughs> I didn't expect a reply. But then I got this, I got this email, um, and the, it, it, the, this is what it said in, in, you know, in, the, in the sender address. It said, AF1 en route home from Kabul. So President Obama had just been in, 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 in Afghanistan, and this was a, a message from... Jeffrey Kuhlman, who's his personal physician, and he said the WHMU, the White House Medical Unit, use, utilizes tranexamic acid in our operations and planning. Thanks for the information. <laughs> I thought, wow, what a, <laughs> whoa, that's a publicity coup, right? <laughs> so then whenever, you know, when these generals said, sit down, Roberts, I said, well, it's good enough for your president, you know, and so, um, that was very good so that we could use this information to, to say, well, look, you know, whenever I'm at a meeting, I say, well, President Obama uses it, you know, 
President Trump's personal physician will use it. You know, why, won't, why don't, aren't you using it in Denver um, or, you know, San Diego or wherever? So that was very good. Oh, so, yeah, I told him all about... And the interesting... Apart from the United States, I got a letter from his personal physician, but I got, a letter, I got letters from lots and lots of presidents or their personal secretaries. And they write back to me and say, thank you very much for this information. We've passed it on to his personal, either the personal physician or the Ministry of Health. So it turned out to be a very good way of getting this on, on the agenda. We've done it for all of our trials subsequently. We just write to the president, and then the president sends it to the right place, usually. But we, we still had a lot to learn about having, how to get research into practice. And we started studying the pharmaceutical industry because the pharmaceutical industry are the experts of getting research into practice. When we think of the pharmaceutical industry and, th and, and, and what, they, what, we, what they do, they would like us to think that they invent clever treatments. That's what they want us to think. That's not true. Clever treatments are invented in universities. What the pharmaceutical industry is really good at is marketing, right? So if you want to go, know about drug development, go to the University of Kyoto. If you want to know about marketing, go to Daiichi Sankyo, yeah? So pharmaceutical companies know about marketing. Now, there was this drug at the time that they were using in Afghanistan called Novo7, right? Novo7. It was a, a blood clotting factor, activated factor 7A. It wasn't particularly, it wasn't effective at all. The randomized trials showed it didn't work and it was associated with significant side effects. So it was a dangerous drug that didn't work, but everybody was using it. You couldn't, it was very expensive, $7,000 per treatment. But you could not die of hemorrhage in the UK without getting this first. It didn't improve anything. It didn't improve outcome at all. But everybody was using it. I just thought, well, I'm going to study the pharmaceutical industry because how can they do that? You know, it's an ineffective drug. It's not licensed for that indication and everybody's giving it. I've got an effective drug that's not licensed for that indication and nobody's giving it. Well, they're only giving it slowly, slowly increasing giving it. So I started to study them and I realized that they don't do, they don't worry about trials. They tell stories. They tell stories. So this was one story. This was, an, this was a commentary in The Lancet, right? So it, it was a single case and it was a commentary in The Lancet. Um, a 19-year-old soldier was admitted, from, it came from Israel. A 19-year-old soldier was admitted with a high-velocity rifle injury. The bullet tore into the inferior vena cava at level 5, causing extensive damage to paravertebral muscles at the exit wound. He was admitted in a critical condition with profound shock. Right? Now, you can imagine him. Right? You, can see, you, know, you can imagine him in, your, uh, in a desperate attempt to control the bleeding, 60 milligrams, micrograms per kilogram of recombinant factor 7A were given intravenously. Ten minutes after the injection, coagulation tests improved, reducing the rate of the bleeding. He survived. Right? So this was a guy, a single soldier, shot, given this drug, miraculous recovery. Absolutely no evidence. That's not evidence of effectiveness. That's a story, right? He could have been, you know, you can't say anything about the treatment effectiveness from that. But this story just spread all around the world. I would go to conferences. This particular soldier, I went to a conference in China and there was a, a, the, the, the stand of this company had a picture of this 19-year-old with his wife and his baby. And this story just went everywhere. It went all over the world, you know. I thought, wow, that's the way to do it. If, to the only thing that will spread information is stories. Story is the only way 
to disseminate information. And then this was sheer genius. And I really respect the pharmaceutical industry for, <coughs> for how clever it was here. Oh, I should tell you what this... Uh, anyway, listen to it first. So, so this is an a emergency medicine soap. We call them soap. I don't know what you call them in Japan. You know, like, they're serial. They, they happen, you know, they, you follow a story. And the story was that this, this woman soldier got injured in, in Afghanistan and they gave her tranexamic acid. Went, How did they get that on national television? You know, I thought, that is brilliant. You know, I want to be able to do that. That's the way, you know... Never, don't bother with medical journals. Get it on the television. <laughs> it was so clever. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I'm an epidemiologist, and, and so, you know, people tell me, right, you know, I've read lots of pop psychology, and it says, you know, stories are the only way to disseminate results, but I want to see some evidence, and, and, and there is evidence. There's evidence from randomized trials that if you want to change physician behavior, stories are more effective. So th this was a, quite a large randomized trial, 20,000 patients, and they wanted to get pe physicians in the United States to, to stop, um, to give opiates. They weren't giving opiates because everybody was worried about addiction, but they, they, they had two, two ways of persuading them to have behavioral change. They, they told them stories, and they told it in the usual way, and if they told them stories, they were much like much more likely to change behavior, much more likely to visit the site and want to know more information. So stories really work. So we realized that we needed a story for tranexamic acid, right? We, did, we had to find a story. Now, unlike, unlike pharmaceutical companies, we felt the story had to be true. You know, we wanted to tell true stories about, pharmace about treatments rather than you know, made up stories. So we, we found one in Japan. So when we, when we did the trial, um, after we got the result, I had no idea where tranexamic acid came from. I just, as far as I was concerned, it was just a drug. But after we did the trial, I said, I said to, I, I thought, well, let's find out where tranexamic acid comes from. So I started Googling and searching and then my search, my search, my search, and then it all, every, everything started going into Japanese. And so I, and I, uh, and I said, oh, you know, I can't, I can't find where this came from, but my wife's Japanese. So I said, will you investigate this? And so she started searching, and she found out that the, the drug was invented by a husband and wife couple called Shosuke and Utako Okamoto. And they, they worked in Kobe, um, in the 1950s and 90s. Well, they worked in Tokyo first, in Keio University, and then they moved to Kobe. And they first published this in September 1962. Uh, on the 1st of September 1962, they published their discovery of this new drug, tranexamic acid, in the Keio Journal of Medicine. Very low impact factor. <laughs> I don't think they worried about impact factor in those days. But I think it did slow the, the, the uptake of this treatment around the world, the fact that, you know, it was invented in Japan. Because um, it became very popular in Japan, but, not, but the rest of the world didn't seem to know about it very much. So um, we said, we found out that Shosuke had died, but Utako was still alive. So the woman who invented this drug, it was a husband and wife team who invented this drug. Utica was still alive. So let's go and see her. Let's go and see this woman. And, and she lived in Kobe, you know, this big, you know where this is. And, and her house was up on this hill over here. 
So we thought, right, let's go and see her. And very unusual home. This was her house, you know, like her, her, it was just an ordinary residential area. And we, we came across her house, you know, Kobe projects on thrombosis and hemostasis. We thought, well, that's an interesting name for your house. <laughs> you know, not many people call your house. This is my son. He's, 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 he's older now, of course, but he, he was my research assistant because I didn't have any funds. Um, and then here, and there, here she is, Otoko Okamoto. So she was 94, 94, but she was really Genki. Um, you know, she was 94, she still, these were her researchers, um, and they still met in her house to, t to talk about research projects. When she retired, she didn't, she didn't believe in retiring, you know. So when the university kicked her out at, 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 I don't know what, age 60 or 65, she just turned her house into her laboratory and carried on working at home. And, um, and these are her research staff. And they were still publishing papers and reading papers. I just thought, my goodness, this woman is fantastic. Um, and I, I wanted to know all about her. And, you know, here she is. This is... Um, uh, Shichigo-san no, no Shashin. So I think she's about seven here. And this is something like uh, 1920s in Japan. So this little girl wants to be a doctor, right? She wants to be a doctor when she grows up. Now that's very unusual of itself in 1920 in Japan. A little girl wants to be a doctor, you know? She doesn't want to do the washing for her husband. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with her? But she was very bright, super bright girl, right? She wanted to be a doctor when she grows up. So she goes to medical school, and here she is doing dissection. And, um, and afterwards, you know, she really wants to get into basic science. She loves, she loves science. So this is her in her laboratory, and that's her husband. So she marries another researcher, um, and, and they're working together in the laboratory. That's their daughter. Right? So in those days, there was no childcare. So they, they brought her daughter to the, to the laboratory with her. Um, she told me an interesting story that the daughter was in a, a bassinet, in a little cot on the floor, and she nearly killed her daughter because she was making a poisonous gas on the, on the bench, and the, and the gas was heavier than air, and it rolled off, and it rolled off onto the floor, and then the baby started going red and crying and... You know, and looking like she was in trouble. And so she managed to rescue the daughter. The daughter's okay. But strangely enough, she's an anaesthetist now in, in Tokyo. So, um, uh, uh, no, she lives in, she lives in, uh, in, in Kyoto, actually. Um, so, she told me about her objectives and um, they decided they had three research objectives to outperform global standards, to avoid current trends, and to find an effective treatment for postpartum hemorrhage. So I thought, wow, that's fantastic because outperform global standards in post Second World War Japan, right? So Japan had just been two nuclear bombs, you know, everything in, in ruin, and they didn't want to be the same as the world, they wanted to be much better than the world. And avoid current trends. I like this one. I, I really in, try and take this advice in my work, is that when everybody's looking at something, medical research is very about fashion. So everybody's, you know, gene editing, you know. While everybody's gene editing, go and do something else. Because it's much easier to find something where everybody is not looking at the same thing. You know, they're much more likely to miss something over there. So she recognized that, avoid current trends. And they were very interested in finding an effective treatment for postpartum hemorrhage because at that time, Japan was like, you know, South Asia, Africa. You know, women had their babies, started bleeding and died. Now they don't. You know, they've got much better nutrition, much better health care. But in those days, it was much more difficult. So she had these, um, so here she is doing uh, research on a laboratory animal, I think it's a dog, 
And this is the family. You would feel very insecure being the family dog. <laughs> you know, you feel very nervous. Kincho, you know. You'd feel very nervous being the dog in that family. But actually, that, the dog was safe. This dog was safe, at least. Um, and they got an award. They, got, they won awards and things. And, um, and you know, uh, they were nominated for a Nobel Prize. They didn't get one. Um, there's a time capsule. I don't know if you know about time capsules, but there, there, there's, like, at that time, people were, like, gathering things together that represented the, the sort of major discoveries of humanity, and then they bury them in the ground in the hope that, you know, in 200 years, people would dig them up and see, you know, what, what was humanity doing 200 years ago? Well, tranexamic acid is buried in one of these... Um, in, in Osaka, in one of these time capsules. Um, and we gave her a certificate on behalf of the, of the crash collaborators for, for making this invention that seemed to be so effective in, in trauma. And then we realized that this woman was the story we were looking for, you know, that this woman's life was really incredible, you know, and, and she told me all sorts of things, how she, um, how she, just fantastic, uh, and it, it's a story of perseverance, of really working hard. So, she, you know, all through her life, you know, from seven to ninety-seven, a hundred years of work, and then we, you know, we find this effective treatment for trauma. At that time, she, I, I, she, you know, I, I said to her, we've got this great treatment for trauma. She said, I don't care about the trauma. Well, I, I do care about the trauma, that's great. But what about postpartum hemorrhage? Why haven't you tested it in postpartum hemorrhage? Um, we did a, we, so she, we decided that she was a, a, our story. And it was a story about perseverance. It's a story about, you know, just continuing to, to try and try and try all of your life. Um, we did other things. We, we, made, we made manga. Uh, we made a manga for emergency physicians. And um, this got in the New York Times as well. Um, and, and I wrote to the, to the director general of the BBC to complain about him to complain about the use of, of this drug, the, the wrong drug being promoted it, it, on the television. And I managed eventually managed to get our drug. So we finally got tranexamic acid onto the television. In the UK, one of the things that made a big difference about getting research into practice was money. So there is a list of things that the, the British Health Service is required to do, and hospitals get more money if they do it. So for example, you know, if a patient's had a heart attack, they should be getting statins. If they don't get statins, the, they take the money away. You know, if, patients, if, if all of the patients are getting statins, they get more money. And we got tranexamic acid incentivized. So hospitals now get, get more money if they give tranexamic acid. And that made a difference. So this, is, this was um, when they started funding tranexamic acid use, when the, the financial incentive came in. And it, it, it the, the use increased from about 0% to 90%. So hospitals in the UK really respond to money. Um, you know, they get most of their money anyway, but they get a, the, the bit extra or a bit less they care about very much. You know, if the budget, the budget might be, you know, 100 million, but whether it's 102 million or 100 million makes a big difference to them. So they care about that, the, the bit at the margin. So, that made a big difference. Now, by this time, we were doing the trial that Utako Okamoto wanted us to do. We were doing the woman trial. And um, it was a trial run by women. Um, I, I, was, I, was involved. I, 
I'm the director of the clinical trials unit, but I, I, I work with this woman called Halima Shakur, who's the co-director. And, um, and it's been very interesting. We're, we're, I'm, a man, I'm a white man, she's a brown woman. Where, wherever we go to get anywhere, everybody thinks I'm in charge. Um, it's just what it's just what's happened. When we, I get promoted faster than she does. You know, we do the same work, but I, it's just being a white man. It, it's easier than being a brown woman, and so I, I've just noticed this from my time with, with working with Halima. You know, we, we're co-directors of the clinical trials unit. We do we've done all of our trials together for the last twenty years, and. I will go to a meeting and people will stick out their hand at me and say, tell me who you've brought with you. you know, so it, it, I found it very sort of difficult, embarrassing over the years. Um, and, but she's, I told you that, you know, I told you the other day that I, I'm only good at some things and I'm not good at other, well, I'm, I'm good at some things and not good at others. And she is very good at bringing together lots of people in trials. So um, in, this is the woman trial in Pakistan. It was our biggest recruiting country. Every, every obstetric hospital in, in, in Pakistan took part in this trial. And, um, and she just makes that happen. I, you know, she's a genius in this social thing. You know? I mean, it's difficult in, in, you know, in Pakistan. Um, so the sort of, you know, obviously it's a Muslim country men don't really interact with women in the same way but you know the women they hug each other kiss each other and the men you know um so but they had a very good relationship and it really it expanded the trial and the trial went very well and it was funded by the department of health the wellcome trust and bill, bill and melinda gates so this time so we got a very nice result from the woman trial, the treatment was equally effective as it is in trauma. Now I told you that I went to the department, I went to the Department of Health when we got a good result and asked for, I asked for half a million dollars. They gave us 10,000. I went to the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation and asked for a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand pounds, and they said it's not enough. They, they said, you need more than that. And so this was really interesting. You know, I mean, they've got deep pockets, I know, but I think it's because they know, because they're, because they're business people themselves, they know how, much, how important dissemination is. So when we went with them with our plan, you know, and we didn't ask for half a million because we didn't think we'd get it, 100,000, they said, well, that's not enough, you know go back and make a better plan, come back, ask, ask for more money. So we had a much, we had a, you know, even, even before, oh, hang on, sorry, uh, let's have a look. So we did all sorts of things. So we, we, you, we started thinking of the trial results as like a film, you know, like a film release. And we actually made a trailer to the film. So we, we made a trailer uh, a sort of a warning that the film is coming, the results are coming.
But the loss of a life of a woman is a loss to a nation, not just to a family. So we had, we had more resources this time because Bill and Melinda Gates know how important it is. And that, that was just advertising that the trial results were coming. And so when the results came, we just, well, the results were really good. They were exactly the same as, as the trauma results, which is very good because it makes you more certain about, it, about both of them. You know, the fact that, you know, it's very, it's, it's, they're very similar problems, you know, and you've got a very similar result, I think makes you more certain about both of those results. But then we, we had so much more preparation, we just got a huge, um, big media hit um, at the time. So Bill, Bill, Melinda Gates tweeted it, and the, you know, Tedros, who's the um, Director General of the World, World Health Organization, so lots and lots of people, um, you know, we got something like uh, 800 items of news coverage, social media, 80 million, some things, are, whatever happens on social media, I don't know. But, um, you know, we just got a much bigger hit. With the Crash 2 results, there was almost nothing in the media at all. But we, we, made, we made it different. Unfortunately, Utico never got to see the results of the woman trial because she died at the age of 98, um, two weeks before uh, we finished the trial. So um, I used to say that Japanese women live forever, but they don't really live forever, they're almost forever. <laughs> um, and so this is, her, this is her grave in Kyoto, actually. So this is a, a, um, a haka in, in, in uh, Kyoto. And where, the, where, the Okuma, where her husband's grave is. Um, and then I started realizing, actually, we haven't got the right story. It's not a story about persevering. It's a story about discrimination. And it's a story about sex discrimination. That Utako, you know, it's partly the fact that she's a woman that actually, you know, she's been, it took her so long to get this intervention. Because what she said, what she told me is that they invented this drug as a treatment for postpartum hemorrhage. And they wanted to get the local obstetricians to try it in postpartum hemorrhage, but they wouldn't. And all of the local obstetricians, uh, the, the obstetricians were, were predominantly <coughs> men, and they wouldn't really have it. They, wouldn't, they weren't interested in testing this. And I, we started to see it more of a problem about discrimination. And, and we got some lovely... I f well, while she was alive, I took some films about... Some film...
な日本に立たなきゃ怪我すまない、うん、だからそこをうまくね逆に利用してさてこれさ<笑>そしてもう新作ばっかり頼んだりするんですよねでそれもねあのこの子供のものまでは自分だけ苦労すればいいんですが人が8時間やるとこは10時間やればいいわけですからね古いんですけれどもでもやっぱりこう見た目の仏様なんて分かりますからね私あの、ま、前に申し上げましたように林隆史先生って非常にその女性の,の仕事に理解のある方がおられたんですねその人ですからずっとても楽だったんですねでも一歩外へ出るとそうはいきませんよ研究室外へ出るとね。一つの例ですけれども、信濃町の慶応病院の中でね、あの学会があることがあったの、それはね、確か小児科学会だと思うんだけれども、そこで、あのひき肉っていうんでね、女性の友達と、ちょっと一人、なんでそっと入ってって、そして前の方へ行ってね、おもしろそうだわね、今日は何の方何人だろうね、聞いてたの。そしたらね、ある顔を,顔を覚えてる、多分小児科の教授だと思うんだけど、さっさと入ってきて、立ちなさいって言われるのね、なぜだか分からないで立ったらね、こっち行ってからついてったらね、ここはあなた方、女っ子たちの来るところではないって言ったの。なんか言ってなかったね、女の子たちのことはあんまり言ってたことなかったのよ、そしたらね、そう言われてね、出されて。So she, she told me lots of stories about that. I mean, the, the sound wasn't so good there, but, but basically she, she went, her and a colleague, female colleague, went to a, a pediatric conference and they were sitting at the front looking very interested. And, and this pediatrician came along, a man, and said, look, what are you two doing here? <laughs> you know, out. <laughs> you know, she, was, she was kicked out of the conference for being a woman. And, and, and he, he said, um, these conferences are not, the place, are not the place for women and children. <laughs> So, um, and I got captured lots of information ab about her. Oh, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want to hear it again. So, um, so with the woman trial, we, we, we started to put the story of tranexamic acid inside the story of Utako's life. So, we realized that the only thing that transmits in, pe in people's minds. Is story, right? So somebody tells somebody else a story and they remember it, and that's how information is transmitted in humans. And so if you want to spread, if you want to spread information to other people, you have to put it in a story. And the story carries the message like a mosquito carries the parasite for malaria. You know, the story takes it from person to person, and then so we, we started, we've been starting to do that, and、um, and that work is still ongoing. We, we're now just finishing with this funding that we got from the Gates Foundation. We, we've made an hour long documentary about tranexamic acid, Utako Okamoto, postpartum hemorrhage, discrimination against women, and we hope, I don't know, I don't know how it, successful it's going to be. But I, I still haven't seen all of, the, all, all of the, the filming. But we hope that this will help to carry the story of tranexamic acid into the world. So, in summary, I think that's like in, 2010, in 2010, we start, I started to try and find out about how to disseminate results. And the key thing I learned is that is about story, I think. And it's.、Um, I think it's sad that there's such a sharp divide between art and science. That, you know, you've got artists over there, scientists over there, but actually the world needs them both because the artists are very good storytellers. So I think scientists need the filmmakers, the anime, the. And why have we got anime about rubbish? You know? Why haven't we got anime about. Prevention of depression or, 
or the treatment of schizophrenia or um, you know tranexamic acid in trauma you know that we should be there's no reason why culture can't be informed by our scientific culture you know why do these two cultures have to be completely separate so I, I'd love to see a way to, you know, to bring art into the university, even the science, you know, the science university. Science is, is culture. And we've got to get our results not into scientific culture, but into culture culture, proper culture, the whole world culture. And that's when things will, be will change.